Preface Every man who wishes to rise superior to the lower animals should strive his hardest to avoid living all his days in silent obscurity. Like the beasts of the field, creatures which go with their faces to the ground and are the slaves of their bellies, we human beings have mental as well as physical powers. The mind which we share with the gods is the ruling element in us, while the chief function of the body, which we have in common with the beasts, is to obey. Surely, therefore, it is our intellectual rather than our physical powers that we should use in the pursuit of fame. Since only a short span of life has been vouchsafed us, we must make ourselves remembered, as long as may be, by those who come after us. Wealth and beauty can give only a fleeting and perishable fame, but intellectual excellence is a glorious and everlasting possession. Yet it was long a subject of hot dispute among men whether physical strength or mental ability was the more important requirement for success in war. Before you start on anything you must plan, when you have made your plans, prompt action is needed. Thus neither is sufficient without the aid of the other. Accordingly, the world's first rulers, who were called kings, adopted one or other of two different policies, seeking either to make the most of their intellectual endowment or to develop their bodily strength. In those days, men had not yet learned to be covetous. Each was content with what he had. It was only when Cyrus in Asia and the Spartans and Athenians in Greece began to bring cities and nations into subjection and to engage in wars because they thirsted for power and thought their glory was to be measured by the extent of their dominions that the test of experience decided the ancient controversy. Brains were shown to be more important than brawn. It is a pity that kings and rulers do not apply their mental powers as effectively to the preservation of peace as to the prosecution of war. If they did, human life would be less checkered and unstable than it is. We should not see everything drifting to and fro in change and confusion. Sovereignty can easily be maintained by the same qualities as enable a man to acquire it. But when idleness replaces industry, when self-restraint and justice give place to lust and arrogance, the moral deterioration brings loss of station in its train. A degenerate ruler is always supplanted by a better man than himself. Success in agriculture seafaring or building always depends on human excellence. But many are the men whose slaves of gluttony and sloth have gone through life ignorant and uncivilized, as if they were mere sojourners in a foreign land, reversing surely the order of nature by treating their bodies as means of gratification and their souls as mere encumbrances. It makes no odds to my mind whether such men live or die. Alive or dead, no one ever hears of them. The truth is that no man really lives or gets any satisfaction out of life, unless he devotes all his energies to some task and seeks fame by some notable achievement or by the cultivation of some admirable gift. The field is wide, and men follow their natural bent in choosing this path or that. It is noble to serve the state by action, and even to use a gift of eloquence on its behalf is no mean thing. Peace, no less than war, offers men a chance of fame. They can win praise by describing exploits as well as by achieving them. And although the narrator earns much less renown than the doer, the writing of history is, in my opinion, a peculiarly difficult task. You must work hard to find words worthy of your subject. And if you censure misdeeds, most people will accuse you of envy and malice. 
When you write of the outstanding merit and glory of good men, people are quite ready to accept what they think they could easily do themselves. But anything beyond that is dismissed as an improbable fiction. My earliest inclinations led me, like many other young men, to throw myself wholeheartedly into politics. There I found many things against me. Self-restraint, integrity, and virtue were disregarded. Unscrupulous conduct, bribery, and profit-seeking were rife. And although being a stranger to the vices that I saw practiced on every hand, I looked on them with scorn, I was led astray by ambition, and with a young man's weakness could not tear myself away. However much I tried to disassociate myself from the prevailing corruption, my craving for advancement exposed me to the same odium and slander as all my rivals. After suffering manifold perils and hardships, peace of mind at last returned to me, and I decided that I must bid farewell to politics for good. But I had no intention of wasting my precious leisure in idleness and sloth, or of devoting my time to agriculture or hunting, tasks fit only for slaves. I had formerly been interested in history, and some work which I began in that field had been interrupted by my misguided political ambitions. I therefore took this up again and decided to write accounts of some episodes in Roman history that seemed particularly worthy of record, a task for which I felt myself the better qualified inasmuch as I was unprejudiced by the hopes and fears of the party man. It is my intention to give a brief account, as accurate as I can make it, of the conspiracy of Catiline, a criminal enterprise which I consider specially memorable as being unprecedented in itself and fraught with unprecedented dangers to Rome. I must preface my narrative by a short description of Catiline's character. Lucius Catiline was of noble birth. He had a powerful intellect and great physical strength, but a vicious and depraved nature. From his youth he had delighted in civil war, bloodshed, robbery, and political strife, and it was in such occupations that he spent his early manhood. He could endure hunger, cold, and want of sleep to an incredible extent. His mind was daring, crafty, and versatile, capable of any pretense and dissimulation. A man of flaming passions, he was as covetous of other men's possessions as he was prodigal of his own. An eloquent speaker, but lacking in wisdom. His monstrous ambition hankered continually after things extravagant, impossible, beyond his reach. After the dictatorship of Lucius Sulla, Catiline had been possessed by an overmastering desire for despotic power, to gratify which he was prepared to use any and every means. His headstrong spirit was tormented, more and more every day, by poverty and a guilty conscience, both of which were aggravated by the evil practices I have referred to. He was incited also by the corruption of a society plagued by two opposite but equally disastrous vices, love of luxury and love of money. Since I have had occasion to mention public morality, it seems appropriate to go back further and briefly describe the principles by which our ancestors guided their conduct in peace and war, their method of governing the state, which they made so great before bequeathing it to their successors, and the gradual degeneration of its noble character into vice and corruption. The city of Rome, as far as I can make out, was founded and first inhabited by Trojan exiles, who, led by Aeneas, were wandering without a settled home, and by rustic natives who lived in a state of anarchy, uncontrolled by laws or government. 
When once they had come to live together in a walled town, despite different origins, languages, and habits of life, they coalesced with amazing ease, and before long, what had been a heterogeneous mob of migrants was welded into a united nation. When, however, with the growth of their population, civilization, and territory, it was seen that they had become powerful and prosperous, they had the same experience as most people have who were possessors of this world's goods. Their wealth aroused envy. Neighboring kings and peoples attacked them, and but few of their friends aided them. The rest were scared at the prospect of danger and held aloof. They girded themselves in haste, and with mutual encouragement marched forth to meet their foes, protecting by force of arms their liberty, country, and parents. Then, after bravely warding off the dangers that beset them, they lent aid to their allies and friends, and made new friends by a greater readiness to render services than to accept help from others. Their government was a constitutional monarchy. Picked men, in whom the physical weakness of age was compensated by outstanding wisdom, formed a council of state, and were called fathers, either on account of their age or because their duties resembled those of the father of a family. In course of time, the monarchy, which originally had served to safeguard liberty and enhance the prestige of the state, degenerated into an oppressive despotism. Thereupon, they instituted a new regime in which authority was divided between two annually elected rulers. This limitation of their power, it was thought, would prevent their being tempted to abuse it. It was in this period that individuals were first able to distinguish themselves and display their talents to greater advantage. For kings are more suspicious of good men than of bad, and always fear men of merit. Indeed, it almost passes belief what rapid progress was made by the whole state when once it had gained its liberty. Such was the desire for glory that had possessed men's hearts. Young men no sooner reached the age when they were fit for military service than they went to camp and learned the art of soldiering in the school of laborious experience, taking more delight in costly armor and chargers than in loose women or the pleasures of the table. To such men no toil came amiss, no ground was too steep or rugged, no armed foe formidable. Courage had taught them to overcome all obstacles. To win honor, they competed eagerly among themselves, each man seeking the first opportunity to cut down an enemy or scale a rampart before his comrade's eyes. It was by such exploits that they thought a man could win true wealth, good repute, and high nobility. Their thirst for glory and ever more glory was insatiable. As for money, their only ambition was to come by it honorably and spend it open-handedly. I could mention places where vast enemy hosts were routed by a handful of Romans and towns of great natural strength that they took by assault. But I must not digress too far from my proper theme. There can be no question that fortune is supreme in all human affairs. It is a capricious power which makes men's actions famous or leaves them in obscurity without regard to their true worth. I do not doubt, for instance, that the exploits of the Athenians were splendid and impressive, but I think they are much overrated. It is because she produced historians of genius that the achievement of Athens is so renowned all the world over. For the merit of successful men is rated according to the brilliance of the authors who extol it. The Romans never had this advantage because at Rome the cleverest men were also the busiest. No one was a thinker without being a man of action as well. Their leading citizens preferred deeds to words, 
and chose rather to do something that others might justly praise than merely to tell of what others did. In peace and war, as I have said, virtue was held in high esteem. The closest unity prevailed, and avarice was a thing almost unknown. Justice and righteousness were upheld, not so much by law as by natural instinct. They quarreled and fought with their country's foes. Between themselves the citizens contended only for honor. In making offerings to the gods, they spared no expense. At home they lived frugally and never betrayed a friend. By combining boldness in war with fair dealing when peace was restored, they protected themselves and the state. There are convincing proofs of this. In time of war, soldiers were often punished for attacking against orders or for being slow to obey a signal of recall from battle, whereas few ever ventured to desert their standards or to give ground when hard-pressed. In peace, they governed by conferring benefits on their subjects, not by intimidation, and when wrong, they would rather pardon than seek vengeance. Thus, by hard work and just dealing, the power of the state increased. Mighty kings were vanquished, savage tribes and huge nations were brought to their knees, and when Carthage, Rome's rival in her quest for empire, had been annihilated, every land and sea lay open to her. It was then that fortune turned unkind and confounded all her enterprises. To the men who had so easily endured toil and peril, anxiety and adversity, the leisure and riches which are generally regarded as so desirable proved a burden and a curse. Growing love of money and the lust for power which followed it engendered every kind of evil. Avarice destroyed honor, integrity, and every other virtue, and instead taught men to be proud and cruel, to neglect religion, and to hold nothing too sacred to sell. Ambition tempted many to be false, to have one thought hidden in their hearts, another ready on their tongues, to become a man's friend or enemy, not because they judged him worthy or unworthy, but because they thought it would pay them, and to put on the semblance of virtues that they had not. At first these vices grew slowly, and sometimes met with punishment. Later on, when the disease had spread like a plague, Rome changed. Her government, once so just and admirable, became harsh and unendurable. At first, however, it was not so much avarice as ambition that disturbed men's minds, a fault which after all comes nearer to being a virtue. For distinction, preferment, and power are the desire of good and bad alike. Only the one strives to reach his goal by honorable means, while the other, being destitute of good qualities, falls back on craft and deceit. Avarice is different. It means setting your heart on money, a thing that no wise man ever did. It is a kind of deadly poison which ruins a man's health and weakens his moral fiber. It knows no bounds and can never be satisfied. He that has not wants, and he that has wants more. After Sulla had used armed force to make himself dictator, and after a good beginning turned out a bad ruler, there was universal robbery and pillage. One man coveted a house, another an estate, and the victors behaved without restraint or moderation, committing foul and inhuman outrages against their fellow citizens. To make matters worse, Sulla had sought to secure the loyalty of the army he commanded in Asia, by allowing it a degree of luxury and indulgence that would not have been tolerated by his predecessors, and the pleasures they enjoyed during leisure hours in those attractive lands soon enervated the men's warlike spirit. 
It was there that Roman soldiers first learned to indulge in wine and women and to cultivate a taste for statues, pictures, and embossed plate, which they stole from private houses and public buildings, plundering temples, and profaning everything sacred and secular alike. When victory was won, as might be expected of such troops, they stripped their enemy bare. Since even philosophers cannot always resist the temptations of success, how should these demoralized men show restraint in their hour of triumph? As soon as wealth came to be a mark of distinction and an easy way to renown military commands and political power, virtue began to decline. Poverty was now looked on as a disgrace and a blameless life as a sign of ill nature. Riches made the younger generation a prey to luxury, avarice, and pride. Squandering with one hand what they grabbed with the other, they set small value on their own property while they coveted that of others. Honor and modesty, all laws divine and human, were alike disregarded in a spirit of recklessness and intemperance. To one familiar with mansions and villas reared aloft on such a scale that they look like so many towns, it is instructive to visit the temples built by our God-fearing ancestors. In those days, piety was the ornament of shrines, glory of men's dwellings. When they conquered a foe, they took nothing from him save his power to harm. But their base successors stuck at no crime to rob subject peoples of all that those brave conquerors had left them, as though oppression were the only possible method of ruling an empire. I need not remind you of some enterprises that no one but an eyewitness will believe, how private citizens have often leveled mountains and paved seas for their building operations. Such men, it seems to me, have treated their wealth as a mere plaything. Instead of making honorable use of it, they have shamefully misused it on the first wasteful project that occurred to them. Equally strong was their passion for fornication, guzzling, and other forms of sensuality. Men prostituted themselves like women, and women sold their chastity to every comer. To please their palates, they ransacked land and sea. They went to bed before they needed sleep, and instead of waiting until they felt hungry, thirsty, cold, or tired, they forestalled their body's needs by self-indulgence. Such practices incited young men who had run through their property to have recourse to crime because their vicious natures found it hard to forego sensual pleasures, they resorted, more and more recklessly, to every means of getting and spending.